Okay, today we're going to read Stargazer to the Sultan by Barbara K. Walker and Mene Sumer. It's illustrated by Joseph Lowe. It's a children's picture book. It's longer than the other ones I've been reading, but this is a very special book to me for several reasons. First of all, in yoga, the first two steps are called yama and niyama. Yama means self-restraint. In other words, refrain from doing bad things socially. And the second level is the observances you must follow to lead the virtuous life. And so the first step in, in this from the Upanishads, not from Patanjali's uh, Yoga Sutras, but from the, from the uh, Upanishads, he says that the first step is nonviolence. And the first step of the observances is Kri. Nonviolence you're acquainted with. It means not doing any harm or anything that would cause harm to anybody, whether you're using words, thoughts, or actions. We should refrain, restrain ourselves from doing harm to others. Kri has to do with, there's several words that we can use with it. Right now I'm going to use the word humility. Non-ego directed. It's more uh, subtle and quiet and not aggressive in any way. And so that observance and that restraint are to a pair of something that you use to balance out. The three helps you to not be uh, violent and the non-violence helps you practice three, humility. They're both needed to help one another. And so this is a story the other, that uh, deals with the humility. And the other thing that I love about this story is it's about a religion that is from a religion, it's a folktale from a religion that is very considered in the West here as being very violent and horrible. This is from the Muslims. And it can show you how great their religion is too, because I believe all religions have their greatness in their special way for the people that are part of those religions. So I want to honor this religion as well as to present something that brings to you the idea of the coordination between Kri and nonviolence, or humility and nonviolence, how they're connected. Okay, so this story is starting right here. Okay. There we go. Little uh, little woodcutter, this man is, a very simple man, very poor man, absolutely no, very, very uh, limited sustenance level in life. Very little food, very little anything, but they still have a, a comfortable life that this woodcutter cutter is satisfied with. He's content with it. That's another uh, observation in, in both uh, the uh, Yoga Sutras and in the Upanishads, we've got Santosha, which means contentment. So that's what this is about. Once there was, and once there wasn't. When yesterday was today, and the sieve lay in the hay, well, in those times there was an old woodcutter who lived at the edge of a village. Every day he trudged off to the forest, a stout rope, and an axe over one shoulder and a bit of bread and cheese on a string, in a string bag over the other. In the morning, chut, 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 he chopped. And in the afternoon, wood, 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 he cried, selling his bundle in the marketplace. Allah willing, the woodcutter earned a few kudus, enough to buy for himself and his wife a loaf of bread, an onion, a cutting of cheese, and three or five olives. Life would have rolled on year after year in this manner if his wife had been content. But alas, she dreamed only of being rich. As fate would have it, she was passing the hammam one day with her water pitcher with a, when a handsome litter carried by four servants arrived before the bathhouse. Out stepped the woman with a dress so beautiful and Jim so glittering that the woodcutter's wife could scarcely trust her own senses. 
she watched as three servants followed the woman into the bath, carrying her parcels of towels and sweet meats and elegant, clean clothing. As soon as the bathhouse door had closed behind them, the woodcutter's wife tugged at the sleeve of the hammam keeper. Who is she? She whispered. Oh, don't you know? He explained. She is the wife of the Sultan's chief stargazer. A stargazer, she mused as she filled her pitcher at the village fountain. My husband, too, must become a stargazer to the Sultan. Then I shall go here and there in beautiful gowns and jingle with jewels and have servants to follow me, bearing my bundles. From the moment her husband entered the cottage that evening, he heard little but stargazer, stargazer, you must become a stargazer to the Sultan, the woman insisted, with her husband all the while staring at her as if she had mislaid her wits. Surely you want me to live in a beautiful house and have fire, fine dresses and wear jewels at my throat? Look, just look at these patches on patches I am wearing. Finally, she stopped for a moment to catch her breath. My wife said the woodcutter patiently. How can I become a stargazer to the Sultan? Of course I should like you to have. And have you to believe, live in a beautiful house and to own all the lovely things that women long for. But I am such a poor grasshopper of a man that I can barely keep us in bread and cheese. Who? would even dream that I could become a stargazer. Pray, wife, be content with what is at hand. After all, we have our own cottage and enough to eat and clothing for our backs. But indeed, who could make such a woman listen to reason? She kept after the poor man and after him with the woodcutter all the while saying, Oh, my dear, how can I? How can you ask such a thing of me? At length, being a good-hearted man and fond of his wife, he agreed at least to think about the matter. A few days later, the woodcutter's wife was wakened by the voice of the town crier, shouting street by street and alleyway by alleyway, Lost! Lost! The Sultan's daughter! has lost her most valuable ring. Reward, reward! The Sultan offers a handsome reward for the finder of the ring. Get up, get up, my husband, called the woodcutter's wife. Here is a chance we have been seeking. Go at once to the Sultan and tell him you are an astrologer of special power and can find the ring belonging to his daughter. If you are successful, we can lead a rich and full life. Go and do not come back into this house until you have become a stargazer to the Sultan. There's the ringer, the wife, calling out the, the big thing. Many years of his wife's nimble tongue had been sampled enough to tell the woodcutter that here he faced a road which had no turning. I begin with the name of Allah, he murmured, and trembling from nose to toes, he put one foot before the other until he had arrived at the Sultan's gate. There he announced himself as a new astrologer. Some come to find the missing ring. Immediately he was led into the presence of the Sultan himself. Understand, astrologer, that if you find the ring, you will be richly rewarded. If you fail, the loss of your head must pay the price of your bad judgment, the sultan declared, marveling that this mere might of a man 
could possess such remarkable powers. Ah, oh, sire, I do understand, the woodcutter answered. I have but one request, if you will be pleased to grant it. Yes, yes, what is that? I must be left alone for 40 days and 40 nights, 40 nights in which to study Allah's handiwork and the stars, and 40 days in which to deliberate upon His mercies. At the end of that time, Allah willing, the truth will be revealed. The little woodcutter knew all too well the only truth that could be known at the close of his watching and waiting, that his claim had been beyond his power to fulfill. The sultan pondered. Then, since my own astrologers, even my chief stargazer, have been unable to promise as much, you may have your 40 days and 40 nights, the sultan agreed. Calling his most trusted servant, the ruler had the woodcutter taken to a room with one wide window near the ceiling. The key was turned in the lock, and the poor woodcutter was left alone with his thoughts. Day after day, he paced the wood flagstone store floor, Night after night, he watched the endless procession of the stars. But what truth could stars tell a simple woodcutter, except that he was indeed no astrologer at all? Long as he might look at the stars, his gazing would discover no ring. It would serve only to remind him of the insignificance of such a grasshopper as he in the eyes of Allah. Each day, the sultan's favorite servant came to bring food to the woodcutter. Wonderful food it was, too, straight from the sultan's table. But in the face of such a fate as this, the woodcutter had no stomach for food. For him, these fine meals brought but a single comfort, a certain way of counting the passing of the days until the sultan must learn the truth which now rested heavily on the heart of the new astrologer. Each evening, just before the servant came to carry away the tray, the poor woodcutter removed one small plate and added it to the pile growing all too quickly in the corner of the room, each time murmuring to himself, 30 more days, and then the sultan will know, or 29 more days, and then the sultan will know. Now, in fact, a great fear had been growing in the heart of the servant, for it was he himself who had stolen the ring belonging to the sultan's daughter. Coming and going, he had one day seen his opportunity, and trusting he would remain unsuspected, he had slipped the ring into the lining of his sleeve, as the time for the daughter's sun gazer's deliberations drew to a close, the servant chanced to overhear the new astrologer murmuring, three more days, and then the sultan will know. Certain that his secret had been discovered, he decided that the only hope for his desperate case rested in the hands of the little stargazer, clearly a kind-hearted man despite his remarkable wisdom. The next evening, instead of merely handing the tray inside, the servant carried it into the room and set it down in its place upon the floor. Then closing the door and locking it from inside, he sank to his knees before the dumbfounded woodcutter. Please, sire, he begged, listen to my story, the tale of a wretched man indeed. Then if Allah moves your heart to do so, help me, please. With his eyes flowing like two fountains in his anxiety and grief, he poured forth the account of his theft, sparing not a single detail. You said last evening, only three more days, and then the sultan will know, he concluded. Now there are only two days left before the truth will be revealed. Allah be praised, you, good sire, will never feel the pain one heedless act can bring. How can you at once a wise, and innocent man know the torment 
of sleepless nights and the anguish of joyless days that have been mine. But, sire, you do know this. If the sultan learns of my guilt, I will lose not only my bread and my bed, but my head. Please, sire, have pity upon me. Do not tell the sultan of my misdeed. I shall do anything, anything, if only you will save me from the fate that lies in store for me when the truth becomes known. For the first time in 38 days, the little woodcutter drew a comfortable breath. Allah alone had spared him, this small grasshopper of a man. Therefore could he himself fail to pity the trembling one, still kneeling before Grasping the servant by the hands, he gazed into his eyes. Fear not, Allah willing, I shall take care of the matter in such a fashion that the sultan will never know who stole the ring. The truth will not be known, but the ring will be found. There is one thing and one thing only that you must do. On the morrow, buy in the marketplace a pure black cock, one with not a single fleck or feather lighter than midnight, while the other household servants are still at prayer, add this cock to the flock in the sultan's poultry yard. On the fortieth day, force the black cock to swallow a bit of dough containing the ring, then leave the rest to me. If you do exactly as I have told, I shall not reveal your secret to the sultan. Earnestly promising to do as the woodcutter had directed, the grateful servant arose, unlocked the door, and left the room. As for the woodcutter, suddenly he had found his appetite. Then he ate all the foods brought from the sultan's table, his heart each moment singing with relief and joy. Very early on the morning of the 41st day, the sultan ordered the servant to lead the new astrologer into his presence. Assured that all had been made ready, the woodcutter walked confidently into the room where the sultan awaited him. Well, you have had 40 days and 40 nights, which you requested, the sultan began. Now, where is the ring? I shall show you the ring in the courtyard today before the call for noontime prayers, the woodcutter answered. Meanwhile, please summon to appear before you just inside the courtyard gate every person in your household of whatever rank, from the highest official to the lowliest servant. In addition, come to be brought to the gate every animal belonging to you and within your palace grounds, dogs, cats, Horses, cattle, poultry, all living creatures that they may pass in procession before you. Allah willing, the ring will be revealed. Curious indeed to discover how the woodcutter would detect the thief, the sultan sent criers to summon his entire household. First in procession came the women, from the highest to the lowest, from those richly attired to those in patches, all heavily veiled. Not a word of accusation passed the lips of the new astrologer and the women returned to their own quarters in the harem and elsewhere about their business. Next, beginning with the grand, grand vizier, came the officials, splendidly dressed. These were closely followed by all the male servants whose work lay within the confines of the palace wall. Making proper obeisance before the ruler, they passed in solemn silent procession. Still, no sign of accusation came from the stargazer, and the men left the presence of the sultan to engage in whispered wanderings about the guilty one. At last came the animals, one by one, some mute and some in protest against this strange turn of affairs. Suddenly, the astrologer spoke, Sir, Yonder struts a black cock. Have him seized and killed. Within his crop you will find the ring you seek. 
Immediately the cock was caught and carried to the sultan. It was but the matter of a moment to relieve the cock at once of his breath and of his burden. Just as the woodcutter had declared, within the crop gleamed the ring belonging to the sultan's daughter. Turning to the woodcutter, the sultan announced, You must now have the rewards you so justly deserve for your services. I pronounce you as official stargazer to the sultan. As soon as you wish, you may move with your household into the small palace just outside my gate. There you will lead a rich and full life. The dazed woodcutter, after taking proper leave of the sultan, hurried home to tell his wife the outcome of his labors. Since the two had little or nothing of value to carry with them, they readied themselves in no time at all to enter the splendid home that now was theirs. Day after day, the wife preened herself before her mirror, trying on one new dress after another, and feasting her eyes upon the gems given to her at the sultan's command. Servants scurried here and there, and none could be prouder than the woodcutter's wife as she sent them about their business. What could be more to her taste than such a life as this? As for the little woodcutter, day after day he sat in idleness, his brain a scramble and his throat a tip-tap with anxiety, for who could tell? what servants might next be required of him by the sultan. The more accustomed his wife became to their new life, the less comfortable the old woodcutter felt. All too soon, these things could be snatched away, and what pleasure could be such borrowed pleasure bring an honest heart? One day, as the woodcutter sat meditating alone in their garden, his wife ran to him, in great agitation. My dear, she cried, you must do something. I cannot go any longer in this poor fashion. Staring at his wife, the woodcutter replied, What poor fashion? It seems to me that we are living in very fine fashion. A short time ago, we praised Allah daily for the meager life we shared in our cottage. Surely, we should be even more grateful for this elegant home in which we dwell. Just see how lovely you look in your new gowns and note the glitter of gold at your throat. How can you call this poor fashion? Ah, she sighed, until today I felt fortunate, but this morning I discovered that the chief stargazer to the sultan has a kiosk within the palace wall itself. His wife dresses far more beautifully than I, and her gems make mine look paltry indeed. I am no longer satisfied, my dear. You must become the Sultan's chief stargazer. Then I shall be happy. Oh, my wife, let not your heart be troubled by envy emerged. Such luxury is not needful for us. Please be content with what we have. But it is easier to make a camel jump a ditch than to make a fool listen to reason. The wife would not accept anything less than the life offered in that kiosk within the palace wall. Go, she said, and do not expect a meal under this roof until you have become chief our gazer to the sultan. Head and hands, the little woodcutter considered his dilemma. Being a sensible man, he valued his life far more than an elegant roof above his head. This house they had was quite fine enough for him, and in time his wife must learn to accept it as the best that he could give her. Well, he knew the risk of further adventure as a stargazer. Far from wishing to become chief stargazer to the sultan, the humble woodcutter desired freedom from even his present official post. As long as he must dwell in dread, no roof could truly shelter him, be it humble or fine. Suddenly he was struck by a plan at once so simple and so sound 
that he resolved to act upon it. Since the Sultan considered his astrologers beyond question men of wisdom, one who appeared the most fantastic of fools could scarcely be thought worthy of such a title. The new astrologer must merely behave as one who had entirely lost his wits so that he could no longer be relied on as an astrologer. Relieved of his position, he could then simply, truly enjoy the comfortable life which his first venture had miraculously brought him. Waiting that afternoon until the palace courtyard had ceased to buzz with, the midday, with its midday activity, he tucked up his robe, set his turban askew, and rushed about here and there within the palace ground, shouting, The Sultan! The Sultan! Who has seen the Sultan? Quickly, quickly, quickly! Suddenly must, something must be done at once! Officials and servants ran toward him from all directions. Hush, man, are you mad? What are you doing shouting thus when the household is at rest? What can you be thinking of? But the woodcutter refused to answer this question, crying again and again, The Sultan, where is he? At the last, at last, a servant reported that the Sultan was in the bath and must not be disturbed. Disturbed, eh? shouted the woodcutter. He will be disturbed indeed when the roof of his hammam tumbles in upon his head. I must see the Sultan at once. Immediately, the new astrologer was seized by two of the men's bodyguard, the sultan's bodyguard. The men has surely taken leave of his senses, one glared. There is not a stouter roof in the whole kingdom than the dome above the sultan's hammam. And they struggled to lead the distraught woodcutter away. Meanwhile, above the music and splashing of the bath, the sultan had heard the crazed shouting in the hall, and hastily wrapping himself in a large towel, he emerged into the corridor to confront the culprit. No sooner had the last of his towel trailed through the doorway when with a thundering crash, the roof of the hammam fell in, leaving the bath a ruin, weak and shock and disbelief. The sultan staggered against his new astrologer, who was of all men the most amazed at the sudden crumbling of the dome. Ah, oh, my stargazer, babbled the sultan. No men of ordinary powers could have foreseen such a calamity. By your wisdom, you have saved my life. For this singular service, I pronounce you chief stargazer to the sultan. Amazed at the outcome of his plan, the woodcutter went home to tell his wife what had happened. She was almost delirious with delight and hastily gathered together the things she considered light in weight but heavy in value. As for the rest, they could be left behind, for, for, for would the two not have far more elegant quarters within the wall of the sultan's own palace? There's a splendid kiosk awaiting them with far more servants and enough dresses and diamonds to gratify the most, even most demanding of women. In short, the woodcutter's wife was at last satisfied. Alas for the woodcutter, however, as the complaints of his wife were swallowed up in her content, the demands of the sultan grew in number. Oh, the anxious little astrologer had been asked no further questions but as chief stargazer, he was expected to be at all times with the, in the sultan's presence, at the sultan's meals, during his rides throughout the countryside, even on his strolls through the palace gardens. Another man might have relished such opportunities, might have basked in such glories, but the heart of the little woodcutter was not as that of other men. For himself, he would never have sought such dizzying heights. Well, he knew that a single misstep could plunge him into the direst of misfortunes. The slender legs of such a grasshopper as he were not meant to cover, carry him to this high post. One day, he was certain all would be lost. Thus he sat silent throughout the grand dinners amused while others made much of their nearness to the sultan. Noting this, 
the Sultan thought one day to tease his chief stargazer out of his thoughts. As they strolled down the garden paths that evening, suddenly the Sultan reached out and scooped up something into his hand. Holding his closed hand before the astrologer, he said, You have remarkable powers indeed. Before all these members of my court, I shall prove your powers. Within my hand, I hold a small something. If you can tell me what it is, I shall grant whatever you wish. It is within my power to give you what you ask. It is within your power to tell me what I hold, thus helpless within my hand. Here was the moment the woodcutter had been dreading, and he had no answer ready. Whatever the sultan had scooped up out of the garden, he held within his hand the life of a poor little grasshopper of a man, stargazer only by strange leaps of fortune. In despair, the old woodcutter responded with a village proverb. You jump once, grasshopper, and you survive. You jump twice, grasshopper, and still you live. But the third time you jump, you are caught. Having spoken, he waited before the sultan. He had offered in a proverb the truth of his own life, and beyond it, he knew no truth at all. The sultan, opening his hand, revealed a grasshopper. You see, he said, turning to his couriers, here is a man with remarkable powers indeed, powers beyond those of ordinary men, powers that lie in the spangled heavens above. Now, my chief stargazer, ask what you will, and it shall be granted. His heart light, his soul filled with relief and joy, the woodcutter answered, Ah, ah, be praised. I have been able to serve your needs, my sultan. What I wish is simply this. I should like no longer to be your stargazer. I want merely to live comfortably and to meditate upon the mercies of Allah. Your wish will be granted, the sultan declared. The skios within my palace wall is yours, and you may come and go within my kingdom as you will. But I relieve you at this hour of your title as stargazer to the sultan. Go in peace, and may your way be open. Thus it was that the little woodcutter was enabled to dwell happily with his wife within the wall of the sultan's palace, with stomach for his food, and with eyes always for the stars, those endless reminders of the care of Allah for even one small grasshopper of a man. That is such a thrilling story. Such simplicity and such humility, true humility, not, not put on humanity, humility, not acting humble because somebody might notice and do some good, but being truly humble. This is wonderful. That's that's a result that one can come to through yoga.